could just kind of get centered, get quiet. Let's have an AA meeting. We're going to open with the serenity prayer. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. I'm Mary Wood. I'm an alcoholic. My sobriety date is July 1st, 1998, and I'm a member of the Came to Believe group here, and I am a substitute. <laughs> it's always good to be a substitute, and it's an honor and privilege, really, to be asked and able to do anything here for Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm grateful. This is an open meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. We are glad you're all here, especially newcomers, in keeping with our singleness of purpose and our third tradition, which states that the only requirement for AA membership is a desire to stop drinking. We ask that all who participate confine their discussion to their problems with alcohol. And this is our AA preamble. This is who we are. Alcoholics Anonymous is a fellowship of men and women who share their experience, strength, and hope with each other that they may solve their common problem and help others to recover from alcoholism. The only requirement for membership is a desire to stop drinking. There are no dues or fees for AA membership. We are self-supporting through our own contributions. AA is not allied with any sect, denomination, politics, organization, or institution does not wish to engage in any controversy, neither endorses nor opposes any causes. Our primary purpose is to stay sober and help other alcoholics to achieve sobriety. I have asked two home group members to help me open up this meeting with how it works and the 12 traditions. Emily will read how it works and then Carol will read the 12 traditions. My name is Emily Cook. I'm an alcoholic yeah. and I'm a member of the um, Came to Believe group. My sobriety date is 1-16-22 and I'll be reading how it works. Rarely have we seen a person fail who has thoroughly followed our path. Those who do not recover are people who cannot or will not completely give themselves to this simple program. Usually men and women who are constitutionally incapable of being honest with themselves. They are such unfortunates. They are not at fault. They seem to have been born that way. They are naturally incapable of grasping and developing a manner of living which demands rigorous honesty. Their chances are less than average. There are those, too, who suffer from grave emotional and mental disorders, but many of them do recover if they have the capacity to be honest. Our stories disclose in a general way what we used to be like, what happened, and what we are like now. If you have decided what you want, <clears throat> that what you want, what we have, and are willing to go to any length to get it, then you are ready to take certain steps. At some of these we balked. We thought we could find an easier, softer way, but we could not. With all the earnestists at our command, we beg of you to be fearless and thorough from the very start. Some of us have tried to hold on to our old ideas, and the result was nil until we let go absolutely. Remember that we deal with alcohol, cunning, baffling, powerful. Without help, it is too much for us. But there is one who has all power, that one is God, and may you find him now. Half measures availed us nothing. We stood at the turning point. We asked protection and care with complete abandon. Here are the steps we took and which are suggested for a program of recovery. Number one, we admitted we were powerless over alcohol that our lives had become unmanageable. Two, we came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. Three, we made a decision to turn our will and lives over to the care of God as we understood him. Number four, we made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. Number five, we admitted to God, to ourselves, and to another human being the exact nature of our wrongs. 
Six, we were entirely ready to have God remove all these defects of character. Number seven, humbly asked him to remove our shortcomings. Eight, made a list of all persons we had harmed and became willing to make amends to all of them. Nine, made direct amends to such people whenever possible, except when to do so would injure them or others. Ten, continue to take personal inventory and when we, when we were wrong, promptly admit it. Eleven, sought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God as we understood him, praying only for knowledge of his will for us and the power to carry that out. Number twelve, having a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps, we tried to carry this message to alcoholics and to practice these principles in all of our affairs. Many of us exclaimed, what an order, I can't go through with it. Do not be discouraged. No one among us has been able to maintain anything like perfect adherence to these principles. We are not saints. The point is that we are willing to grow along spiritual lines. The principles we have set down are guides to progress. We claim spiritual progress rather than spiritual perfection. Our description of the alcoholic, the chapter of the agnostic, to the agnostic, and our personal adventures before and after make clear three pertinent ideas. A, that we were alcoholic and could not manage our own lives. B, that probably no human power could have relieved our alcoholism. And C, that God could and would if he were sought. Hello, I'm Carol Group and I'm an alcoholic. Hey, Carol. Carol. My sobriety date is February 8th, 2020 and I'm a member of the Came to Believe group. I have the AA traditions. To those now in the, its fold, Alcoholics Anonymous has made the difference between misery and sobriety, and often the difference between life and death. A can, of course, mean just as much to uncounted alcoholics not yet reached. Therefore, no society of men and women ever had a more urgent need for continuous effectiveness and permanent unity. We alcoholics see that we must work together and hang together, else most of us will finally die alone. The 12 traditions of Alcoholics Anonymous are, we AAs believe, the best answers that our experience has yet given to those ever urgent questions. How can AA best function and how can AA best stay whole and so survive? And here are the 12 traditions of Alcoholics Anonymous. One. Our common welfare should come first. Personal recovery depends upon AA unity. Two, for our group purpose, there is but one ultimate authority, a loving God as he may express himself in our group conscience. Our leaders are but trusted servants. They do not govern. Three, the only requirement for AA membership is a desire to stop drinking. Four, each group should be autonomous except in matters affecting other groups or AA as a whole. Five, each group has but one primary purpose, to carry its message to the alcoholic who still suffers. Six, an AA group ought never endorse, finance, or lend the AA name to any related facility or outside enterprise, lest problems of money, property, and prestige divert us from our primary purpose. Seven, every AA group ought to be fully self-supporting, declining outside contributions. Eight, Alcoholics Anonymous should remain forever non-professional, but our service centers may employ special workers. Nine, AA as such ought never be organized, mm -hmm. but we may create service boards or committees directly responsible to those they serve. Ten, Alcoholics Anonymous has no opinion on outside issues, hence the AA name ought never be drawn into public controversy. Eleven, our public relations policy is based on attraction rather than promotion. We need always maintain personal anonymity at the levels of press, radio, and films. And 12, anonymity is the spiritual foundation of all our traditions ever reminding us to place principles before personalities. I'd like to thank Emily and Carol for helping me with that. We have a meeting schedule that I'd like to share with you. Some of you know it, some of you might be confused by it. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, we are one group that meets twice a week. On Tuesdays, we meet from 7 to 8 p.m. It's a closed meeting in that choir room uh, that some of you are familiar with across the parking lot a little bit. Uh, the first three Tuesdays of the month, we study the big book, Alcoholics Anonymous, from cover to cover. On the fourth Tuesday of every month, we study the tradition that corresponds with the number of the month from the 12 Steps and 12 Traditions book. And when we have a fifth Tuesday, we study AA history from AA literature. On Fridays, we are primarily still a closed meeting from 7 to 8 p.m. in that choir room that I mentioned. We have a closed discussion meeting. The chairperson picks a topic from AA-approved literature and then calls on home group members to share their experience with the topic. Except for on the last Friday of the month, such as tonight, we have our open speaker meeting. We uh, enjoy fellowship, 6.15, 6.30, coffee, snacks, and um, a wonderful speaker meeting beginning at 7. Uh, closed meetings are for alcoholics or anyone having a desire to stop drinking. Open meetings are for anyone desiring to attend. And this is an open meeting, and we are so glad you're all here. Um, I am going to take liberty to introduce the speaker, and uh, I haven't asked permission, I will beg forgiveness. Uh, we have some habits and traditions in our group, and, uh, and I'm just going to uh, ask for grace because I just adore this woman. I was changed when I heard her speak here in this room years ago, and uh, she touched my heart when, when she shares, she shares uh, just so powerful a message about what God can do with any of us. And uh, she's a great example of grace, of the power of this program, of the, and, and I think especially, or maybe not especially, but the power of service. And uh, she's a fantastic AA member and a dear friend. I love her so much. Please help me welcome Susie. That's a little scary. Because I might have to kind of, I may have to act different. No, I'm just kidding, y'all. I'm Susie Donahue, I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Susie. My Sprite Aid, September 29th, 1987. My home group's There's a Solution in Holly Springs. Meets Tuesdays and Thursdays. Seven o'clock, pretty basic. Beginners on Tuesday. On Thursday, we do literature and then speaker. I could not remember that schedule if I wanted to. I've come to this meeting umpteen times. I still don't have that schedule now, so thank goodness I don't live in Rocky Mountain. I'd be in trouble. However, um, sponsorship, um, I'm so grateful I met my first sponsor, my first night at AA. Um, I've always been sponsored except for a very short period of time when I had an idiot for a sponsor. It was me when I moved for about six months. And I learned quickly that was very painful. So I got somebody. But um, I really believe the greatest gift that we receive in Alcoholics Anonymous isn't getting sober. I believe it's the treasure of the gift of working with others. I think that's really what it's all about is, you know, AAs, I've been told from great people that I've, you know, been around in rooms just like this, it's about letting go and it's about loving. You know, that's the whole program of Alcoholics Anonymous. And, you know, if that were true, if I could just come in and do those two things, I wouldn't be coming to the meetings every week. So I get closer. Can y'all hear me? Okay. So long story short, I got a lot of work still to do and I'm glad that I get to come here and I get to learn and I get to be a part of things. Uh, you know, in a general way, I'm going to tell you a little bit about my life and uh, what what transpired, what happened actually to me, and uh, how I became and began, you know, the way in which I live today. But first, I'm going to thank, um, I believe it was Paige, it could have been, could have been a little bit of Paige and Kevin that asked me to speak. I want to thank you all both. I appreciate you letting me come here. Home group, thank you guys. It means the world to see, you know, people that are actually in my home group and that care enough to come all the way, you know, an hour and a half in bad traffic. So thank you so much. All of you guys and all the friends. I mean, it's a it's a warm group tonight, and I'm still nervous because I want to do a good job. You know, who knew? You know, that's how we are. So I'm going to just tell my story, and it's real simple. Um, God's supposed to catch, you know, connect in here in a minute or two, and then I, the nervousness will probably pass because I won't be talking. 
So what I can tell you is I was raised in Seattle, Washington, and uh, I had a dad that was a dentist and a, a doctor and a mom that was a psychologist, and I was kidded that I was her pet project. She always knew when I was depressed because probably I was eating something, and uh, you know, and it was often because I didn't get a boyfriend or something like that. She'd always tell me what was wrong with me. That kind of runs in the family, I think. But anyway, um, you know, I was raised right. I had rules and a lot of, you know, you know, ideas about how to live life. I had two older brothers, a younger brother. We lived in a beautiful home, great neighborhood, golf and country club arena, that kind of life. Everything looked good from the outside. But I mentioned inside the house there was a lot of chaos, there was a lot of drinking, a lot of partying, like beautiful gowns and you know tucks and tails and fancy parties and clinking glasses, and it looked really attractive to me. It was very exciting at my house at night. You know, and as a little girl, I used to want to sneak down and watch the party, you know? And it was a lot of fun, and sometimes they'd let me go and, like, you know, dump the ashtrays and a little thing, and I got to be a part of the party, you know? So I liked that environment early on, I really did. And drinking looked so, you know, looked so majestic and romantic and fun, you know? And I remember that being a big thing, but at my house it wasn't that way, because when the party was over, it was really over. You know, people had wrecked cars, there were fights in the parking lot, you know, of our, in our front yard, uh, people backing into the house by accident instead of reversing going forward into the garage. I mean, crazy. My father hit a wall one night. You know, my mom and my dad would go fist to fist, cuff to cuff. It was painful. It was a lot of drinking. And, you know, I always thought when I was a little girl that if I just prayed hard enough, I went to church every Sunday. My father's best friend was a Catholic priest. And I just believed if you prayed, you know, God would take care of that stuff. And he'd fix that problem in my house with those drinks. Because I was smart enough to know that drinks had something to do with that stuff that was going on. You know, and nothing ever changed, you know. And then, you know, as I began to be a teenager, it looked more and more alluring and more and more exciting. And I couldn't wait to drink. My brothers were already pulling beers out of the refrigerator and cracking them open and drinking them in the house, you know. And then I was at a baseball game uh, one night with my oldest brother. And they called me and my brother down to the, the office. And that's not normal. And, uh, you know, the, the priest was there and my other brother. And I found out that, you know, I thought for sure my mom, she was the crazy one where the paramedics always had to come to our house because my mom would get drunk in the middle of the day and practically light the kitchen on fire trying to light a cigarette with the stove. So I immediately thought it was, oh, there she goes again. My mom's done something crazy, right? And they'd come to get us kids and take us somewhere again or move us somewhere or take us to a safe house or my dad was at work and they couldn't find him. So that was always my thought. And when they called us down, they said, you know, your father drove off a cliff drunk and killed himself. You know, and so at that point, it was like, there's like these turning points in my life. And I remember at that point, it was a, a pivotal moment where I was like, if that's God, if that's the God I have, if my God doesn't have enough power, he just, he's going to like take my dad, the only person I care about, if there, there's no power in God. And I remember at that point separating, I didn't want to go to the funeral. I didn't want anything to do with any of that stuff. No longer did I go to youth group. I was, I pretty much excommunicated myself. You know what I mean? I was like done with God. And it was a pivotal moment, and it stuck with me for years and years. And I blamed that faith. I blamed those people. I blamed all of it on that, and I carried that with me. And I used it, you know, often whenever I'd have to pull that out of my backpack because I didn't want to go to church. I'd smoke things in the parking lot at church. I'd drink in the, but I wasn't going in, by golly, you know. And that's how I was. And for a long time, I was like that. You know, and then right away, six months into, you know, being crazy and drinking my first drink, you know, at 12 year, and a half years old, I had the opportunity to actually find out what was in those clinking glasses, but we didn't have glasses. We had cans of beer. They were Mickey White, like, like a wide mouth beer, and we popped them open, and there was a really cute boy there, and I was very impressed with him that he had four beers, gave me one, and I was working on the other one, maybe two more, depending on how fast I got rid of this one, but I knew you could just pop those down. I just knew it. It came natural. I just drank the whole thing, and I started to feel kind of warm, a little bit kind of warmth. I kind of liked that warmth, and I got him to give me another one, and then there was still another one left. And so I was going hard for this one, and I just remember drinking that second one, and then after that, I don't have any memories other than I felt like I was very cute, very fun to be with, and very popular. And then I passed out, and my brothers found me like three hours away, or no, three hours later in the schoolyard side, Wood, wooded area and my shirt was all buttoned funny, like I'd been very busy, very friendly. <laughs> and uh, whoever buttoned me up couldn't remember what to do when they were as drunk as I was, I don't know. Maybe I buttoned myself, I don't know. But there was like vomit on one shoe and no shoe on the other foot. That's what I do remember going home like this, you know? And that, that's an often thing for me when I drank. 
I would lose shoes. Um, but that was my first night drinking, and at 12 and a half, you would have thought, oh my gosh, poor kid, she'll never do that again. How embarrassing. She's probably in tons of trouble and went home, nothing happened. My family didn't even know I was out drinking. Just went to bed, you know, vomited all, and woke up and started over, and three days later, I'm back drinking with the same high school kids. At 12 and a half, I'm hanging out with high school kids. And that was kind of my story for a while, you know? I didn't care about God, didn't care about my family, and all I wanted to do was party, and that's what I did. And, uh, you know, my idea of partying was, if you had it, I did it. Didn't matter what it was, I was open to, I was a free spirit, you know what I mean? I would do anything you had. So I was open to anything as long as it was free, preferably. And, uh, you know, that's what I did for like about, you know, a year, and it was close to about a year of, of hard, um, you know, weekend warrior kind of stuff, and I was still going to school and still trying to live within the means of living at my house and with my mother and stuff. And then one day, you know, my mom drank again and she was supposed to be sober. And when she drank, I just walked out, put a backpack on my back and left and started living downtown with a bunch of crazy, you know, homeless kids. And that was my story. I stayed in high school doing correspondence at a center downtown. And, uh, you know, by then, uh, you, know, my, you know, most kids my age were just going out on weekends, racing cars, going to Hardee's at one in the morning, eating too much bad, you know, you know, hamburgers and food, and then going home. And what I was doing was trying to work in bars and restaurants to make a living to find a place to live. And that's what I was doing. And I was able to, you know, get a lot of alcohol that way. A lot of people like to pay in alcohol back then because I was so young, I wasn't supposed to be working. So they'd let me work in kitchens and in the back of bars. I could do dishes and all kinds of things. And a lot of times I'd just get paid either in a room or I could stay at the bar or I could drink. And it was just what I wanted. And I began to drink daily. You know, by the time I was 14 years old, I was pretty much drinking most days. You know, when I drink, you know, something happens to me. I don't just get fun to be with. It lasts about half an hour. I either just end up passing out or sliding down the chair, you know, real attractive. My hair on one side, I'm thinking I'm looking pretty good. You know, but, you know, that's how we are when we're in a bar and we're drunk. And then, you know, I find a nice guy to hang out with and I end up, you know, getting passed out about 8.30. He's just starting to drink, you know, and I've been drinking since like 4 or 3, you know. And then he just puts me in his, over his shoulder, drags me out to the car, you know, that kind of thing. And, you know, it's just a bad thing. It's just like I'm the one that always ends the party because I can't stay awake. I can't stop blacking out. And, you know, it's just, it's a... It's a pointless task for me to drink, but I can't stop at that point. Already at 15 years old, I can't stop. I can't control how many I'm gonna have. You know, the old idea of just going out and having one or two, maybe a little something to eat first, go to your stomach. I tried all those things, you know. I didn't want to coat my stomach. I wanted the buzz, I'll just be honest with you. I wanted to feel the effect of alcohol. That's why I drank, you know. And I talked about my crazy family because, you know, I thought that was what was going on, is they were just drinking too much, and as long as I didn't act like them, I wasn't an alcoholic. As long as I didn't end up having the paramedics call on me and try to light my hair on fire <laughs> with a cigarette, I'm good, you know. I mean, that was like the low bar of alcoholism, you know. As long as I don't act like that, I can still work. I can still keep a place, you know, with another couple of people in a bad motel, seedy, terrible part of town. I'm doing all right. I'm going to be okay. I'm going to graduate from high school and I'm going to get out of this dump, you know. And that was, you know, the beginning of me doing all these starting overs. I don't know if any of you can relate to that. But, you know, I would begin with a great path. I would want to, you know, go ahead and get a real job. Now I'm about 16, 18 years old. I'm starting to be able to really work legally. And I want to do something with my life. I want to go to college. You know, I graduate early and I, you know, apply for a, a, a scholarship in California to a very prestigious school. And I'm all set to go and I get the scholarship. And I can't get on the bus the next morning because I've been at the Green Dolphin all night long, you know, winning pool games and drinking, you know, my winnings. And somebody slipped something in my drink and I end up in Dallas, Texas three days later, you know, and uh, it's true, uh, Dallas, Texas, I'm coming to in, a, in the back of a van and, uh, you know, there's people I don't even know, I don't even recognize their faces and I'm sitting there and I'm like, yeah, I know people downtown brought me off, you know, I don't know anyone, I'm terrified, absolutely, utterly terrified. You know, like, you know, 18 years old, not, not even 17 years old, terrified. I'm supposed to be going to, on a bus to college and, you know, we'll meet my dorm, you know, my dorm mate. And I, I'm in, in, and I've missed it. It's been three, four days <coughs> for me. And again, like any good alcoholic, I don't want to go to California. I don't even like those tree hugging hippies anyway. You know, we always come up with some reason why we didn't want to go, or it wasn't any good, or the school sucked. Or, oh, sorry. You know, it was just a bad situation, or I didn't really. I don't need that. I just wanted to know I could get it. You know, you know how we are. 
that ego just kicks in every time I fail, you know? And so there's more and more attempts to try to do something with my life. You know, if I, I don't need the college, I'll just go get a good job, you know? So I go to the university and I get a job because I can type, you know, a little bit. And so I get a job here and there. And, you know, sure enough, I can't hold any job because I can't show up. For like three or four days in a row, I'm good. Just not on Mondays or Fridays, but like Tuesday through Thursday, I'm pretty good. But then Thursday when they have the specials at the Chinese restaurant that I found across the street, Two o'clock, three o'clock, I'm already thinking about those, because you know, Chinese restaurants make strong drinks. And I keep thinking about happy hour over there, you know? And suddenly I'm getting a fever. I can feel I'm getting a fever. <laughs> then my stomach's just churning. Gosh, golly, you know? Like, I start lying. It's like a pathological thing where I just lie to people about, you know, I gotta, get, I gotta leave, I'm sick, I gotta go. And sure enough, I go around the alley and get a drink at the Chinese restaurant. And I feel terrible, I really do. I, I really honestly feel bad about doing that. There comes a point of doing those kind of things over a period of time I didn't feel so bad anymore. You know, that, um, that idea that I was hurting somebody or it was the wrong thing to do, that, that consciousness was getting, you know, anesthetized by alcohol. And pretty soon, you know, I was doing things that I wasn't proud of. You know, finding a wallet in a lady's bathroom and instead of turning it in, just taking the money out of it and, you know, tossing it in the garbage can. And then realizing, you know, some woman's looking for her wallet and I'm there helping her look, you know. That's the kind of person I'm becoming, you know. And I'm drinking and doing other things now, trying to stay awake, you know? I mean, a little bit of cocaine goes a long way when you drink like I do, you know? And that's what I did. And, and you know, began, it just began to be on a cycle, a downhill cycle of, you know, they would only let me drink so, my good friends, you know, my good friends, would only let me drink one, you know, you know one of those big Eng old English quarts. I used to be able to drink a whole quart. Then they'd only let, okay, you can have a half a quart because otherwise you can't speak when you go out to street scan, you know? So, I mean, they, like, watch how much alcohol I drink and then I go out and I get money for drugs and then I come back and I just want to drink. All I wanted to do was just leave me alone and just let me drink. I wanted to drink alone in a way. And you know, I kept losing apartments. I don't know, I couldn't pay rent on the, not even by the 15th I couldn't pay rent. You know, I got fired from a 7-Eleven. You know how hard it is to get fired from a 7-Eleven? <laughs> All you have to do, I can tell you, that I, I deal. Smoke their cigarettes, drink their beer at 6 a.m. when the manager comes in. That's how I do it. That's what I did. So my last job before I got sober, I was at a 7-Eleven for a couple of weeks, I think. Yeah, a couple of weeks. I think it was, yeah, probably a couple of weeks. So that was kind of like the highlight of my life where I was starting over. Then I met Mr. Mr. Wright. Came into my life and I knew it was perfect. He didn't drink, he could take care of me. And I found out, he, I thought he had a cold problem. He went to the bathroom all the time. Couldn't figure out why, you know? And he was doing things in the bathroom that, you know, take a little bit of time. So needless to say, he had the worst problem as I had, you know, drinking. We were quite the match, perfect match, as a matter of fact, you know, partners in crime. And uh, it began to be a downward spiral. And, a spiral. and uh, pretty soon I'd used any family I had ever had anywhere in the country that even wanted to even mention my name or mutter it ever again. We'd already stayed at their house, you know, had a flat tire, they paid for a new tire or six new tigers or whatever it was. You know, and then his family, we'd gone to different parts of the country for his family and lived off of them. And pretty soon there was no one left, you know, and we were in an abandoned trailer. And, uh, you know, it was a pretty, uh, pretty filthy, dirty place and there was no running water. And my ex-boyfriend was a, uh, he was a great guy, <laughs> worked for the phone company so he could wire anything. And he wired the telephone cord to the next uh, trailer so we could use the phone to get things that we needed, you know. Well, it's not DoorDash, by the way. But anyway, <laughs> so um, we always had a phone access, even though we didn't have running water. And we just kind of lived there, kind of sat there, and different people would come in and out. And uh, I remember one night I was really, really sick. I was so sick I couldn't do any more of the stuff that was in the bathroom with my boyfriend. And uh, I was utterly so sick I could barely drink. And that's a pretty bad day when you can't even drink and you want to. And I mean, I would get some in me, and I'd spit it up. Um, my stomach was just... <laughs> bad off and I had a, they said I had cotton fever, they said I was sick, I had an abscess on my arm, I was really, really ill. I was laying in blankets, filthy, dirty, sleeping bag blankets that had been in that trailer for probably 10 years. God knows what was on them, but I was freezing to death, shivering, shaking. And I'm thinking, as soon as I feel better, I'm gonna go in that bathroom and I'll feel better. I know that'll, that'll work, that'll work. And that was the training that I had, you know, the, the next thing will make me feel better because that's all it was about was how I felt, you know. And I remember it's like five o'clock in the morning, the birds are chirping and you know, it's a terrible time of morning for people like us. And I look out the window and there's a man and a woman, they're getting in their car and you know, like a Sunday morning and they're, I don't know if they're going to church or going to work, but they're getting up and they have a baby and they're uh, 
kind of the guy's kind of like throwing the baby up and playing with him, and then he kisses the baby and he hands it back to his wife. And uh, I just think to myself, you know, I'll never have that. And that's all I ever really wanted was just to be a part of a family, just to love somebody, to have someone love me. And at that moment, just dawned on me, I, I just only loved alcohol. That's all I love, you know. And, uh, and it just broke me. And I just said, dear God, help me. Just help me. And, uh, you know, at that moment, you know, you know, there wasn't like a, you know, fireworks or anything crazy. But it, very shortly thereafter, a voice in the back of my head said, pick up the phone. And, uh, you know, I just uh, thought someone was behind me, but there was no one behind me. Mm. And they were in the bathroom, and I heard it again. Susie, pick up the phone. And it was like almost, it was almost like an auditory voice. It was not mine. And I was a little bit scared, and uh, I remember seeing the phone cord down the hall toward where the bathroom was. And I just started pulling the cord, you know. And I picked up the phone, and back in 1987, for all of you that have been born like yesterday, <laughs> you could push a zero and get an operator, and there'd actually be a live person, and they would say, can I help you? And I said, yeah, you can help me. I'm dying. I'm killing myself. I'm dying of alcoholism. I need help really bad. Please help me. And the girl goes, oh, honey, you're going to be okay. And for just a moment, just a brief moment, there was a peace that just, it was just there. And it had not been there, even a half a second before that. And then all, like, it's just like, you know, Niagara Falls, I start crying and boo-hooing and telling her what I'm doing. And I'm shoving things in my arms and I'm doing, and I can't help, I can't stop, and I need help, and I keep drinking. And my family won't talk to me, and I rob my family. And all of a sudden, I'm like, oh my gosh, overshare. You know, like I said too much, and I just put the phone down. I didn't know what to do. I was so embarrassed still. My ego was still intact that I put the phone down, you know. But by then it was too late, you know. I knew cops were gonna roll up, SWAT team was coming, you know. That was my first thought, and I thought, you know, there's enough of that stuff in the shag carpet, there's probably enough to put me in, put me in jail. And then I thought, no, I'll probably go to prison. And I thought, good. And it was like a relief, kind of like, come get me. You know, I didn't want to move. I was like, come get me. And I yelled to my boyfriend and I said, the cops are coming. You better get out of here. And him and that lady, that dealer, they left and I never saw him ever again. I was with him for 10 years. He was going to marry me. I knew it. I knew it. He was going to just really quickly, soon after, he was going to marry me. But he never did. I never saw him again. And I just stayed there waiting for the cops to come. And of course, I'm a little upset. The cops don't come. They know me by name by now in the Seattle area, but they don't come. And uh, the phone rings in, and I answer the phone. I think it's going to be the police. You know, they're going to call me and tell me to step outside or something kind of cool. And it wasn't. It was King County Detox. And a man said, my name's Ron. I'm with King County Detox. Is there someone there that wants help now? Wow. And uh, I said, I need help. And he said, well, I got a bed, and it's available till 930. If you want it, you'll get here. Otherwise, I'm giving it to somebody that wants it. And you know, today we're like, can I get you an Uber and a breakfast sandwich if you want to go to treatment? Do you need clothes? Should we go by Walmart? You know, I mean, that's how we are now. And it was just really direct, like, take the help or, you know, stay where you are. And I remember just grabbing the bottle of Old English. And it was like a vision. I could see myself, here I am, drinking a bottle of Old English and heading up to the bus, hoping there's a bus that will take me to detox, you know? And sure enough, Sunday morning, no buses, and a bus just comes, just just comes. And uh, it was one thing after another like that. As soon as I turned toward what I didn't even know was really God, but the way I went toward that prayer that I had said, everything became like an alignment, an absolute spiritual alignment. I didn't know it then. I just thought it was lucky the bus was there. I got on it. The guy let me drink the old English in the back. No one else on the whole ride on down to downtown to Pike Place Market or Pike Place Street. Nobody else got on. I just finished the Old English. I went into detox. They weighed me. I weighed 89 pounds. I had four teeth on the top of my mouth left. <clears throat> no other teeth. And, uh, you know, I was sick. I, my liver was swollen. And they said I was dying of malnutrition. I was literally dying. And I had no idea I was dying from alcoholism. I really had no clue that's that what was wrong with me. I knew I drank too much, but I wasn't like my mom. You know, that's what was in my head. And sure enough, you know, I, uh, I got there and they tried to give me some sandwiches, cheese. I don't know why they give cheese sandwiches to people at detox. It's not really good. But I couldn't swallow. I had like sores in my throat. And uh, they think I hadn't eaten probably about five or seven days is what they thought. And uh, I probably hadn't, honestly. 
and the only water I had was, you know, from other things. And so, you know, needless to say, I couldn't eat. And they took me into the AA meeting and just sat me down, you know, kind of like a project, like put her down there. And uh, the other people were in a circle, and uh, I don't remember. I wasn't like, oh, I'm home, thank goodness. You know, it wasn't like that. I, uh, these people looked very strange to me. They had nice pleated, you know, skirts, and they were wearing jackets, and they looked like they had been somewhere. They were business people. They were clean, they smelled good. You could see their cars outside through the barred windows. None of them had dents in their cars. I saw that. It was weird. I didn't understand these kind of people. How did they live like that, you know? It was so foreign to me, such an idea to live like that. And they were so kind and funny, like people were laughing and I, I saw nothing funny at all at that moment. Nothing was funny to me. And then at the end, a woman screamed, or a woman yelled to this other girl, you know, she said, I haven't had a drink or anything in 10 years. It works, you know, and she, that was like her final thing she was saying and, uh, to this young girl. It was after the meeting, and, and I was like, that's crap. 10 years, you had nothing, because I know everything, you know? And she said, what's your name, honey? And I hate that. Honey. And I was like, Susie, Susie. And uh, she was like, um, are you done for good and all? Have you had enough yet? No. And nobody ever asked me that ever in my life, you know? I thought if I was done, but then I always came up with, well, that's a t I don't know. I just don't know. You know, that was my answer always. But, you know, I told her the truth. I said, yeah, I think I'm done. And then she said, are you willing to go to any lengths in Alcoholics Anonymous to stay sober? And I said, I'll try. And then she said, are you willing to believe in God? And as soon as I heard God, she could just see it. I'm thinking sundresses, like my good friend says in the meeting. I'm thinking church. I'm thinking singing choirs. I can't sing. I'm thinking all the things. No, they're going to tell me how to live, how to act, how to be. I can't. I can't. I, that's all I can think of is I can't. I won't. I can't. And she says, good orderly direction, group of drunks. And I said, I can do that. And so she came across the room, and I was thinking, great, I was hoping to get his phone number, not, you know. And uh, she gave me, and it wasn't a phone number, it was an address to an AA meeting. She was smart. She didn't give me her phone number, you know. She gave me, and she wanted me to ask her for help. That's how it was back then. You didn't get a piece of paper with a bunch of phone numbers. You had to humble yourself and go ask somebody. But anyway, I didn't even know that at that point. But that's what worked. She, uh, you know, gave me that address, and two days later, I showed up at her home group. And she asked me to come early, and I did. I showed up early, and uh, she showed me the book of Alcoholics Anonymous. She said, this is where the solution is. It's like a textbook. You're not going to really study it, but you're going to know it. You're going to use it constantly, I hope, for the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. She said, I'm going to show you what you know about Alcoholics Anonymous, and that was the first page, and there was nothing on it. And she put my name in the book, and then she handed me, gave me a book, and we just started to read page by page, line by line. She just took me literally through the book, took me through the steps, and as she worked the steps with me, she showed me how to sponsor other women. She said, I want you to make sure that you're going to be willing to do this work that I'm doing with you. And I said, well, let's get me sober first and see how I do, you know? And she said, it doesn't work like that. If you won't promise me that you'll do this work with another person, I'm going to go work with someone else that wants to. And she was serious. She was going to get up and walk away from me. And I was like, please help me. You know, I've said that a lot in my life sober. Please help me. And I believe that that's the beginning of transformation. That was the beginning. Once I believed it could happen, it did. And I believed in this woman. I believed something about this woman. Her whole, like the book talks about her whole deportment. It just shouted that there's a different way to live. And I've been doing it. And if you want it, I'll give it to you. You know, it was just amazing to me. And that's what she did. She literally, you know, stuck me in her car and drove me to meetings. I didn't know where we were going, if we were going out to eat, if we were going to go pick up somebody and take me to detox. She didn't talk a lot. What she did, she read that book. She suggested that I call her every day. And, you know, early on, she just wanted me to get that, you know, the idea of meeting people and getting busy doing service immediately. I mean, I met Charlie, the guy I always talk about in the meeting about having to straighten all the chairs after I put all the chairs out that he could go and straighten them all. And it used to really hurt my feelings, but, you know, we talked finally. But, you know, he did that because he was a perfectionist and everybody laughed and everybody knew that's who he was. And we loved him. But, you know, that was the beginning of me getting busy and getting out of my own way. You know, it had been a lot of years since I'd gotten out of my own way. And that sponsor helped me to see the truth about myself. You know, not just during the fourth step, it was very uncanny for me to finally realize how much damage a 27-year-old kid can do. You know, it's a lot. 
that's a lot of damage to a lot of people, you know? And I, I began to see the things that, the things I was living with, which, you know, was, it was constant, you know, the arrogance on one end and the, the just the, the shady, low life kind of life that I had, you know, the two don't really work together. They used to nickname me the most arrogant homeless street person you never met, you know? And because we come in here highly arrogant, but desperate, and it's just such a, ox you know, it's a, I don't know what you call that, there's a word for it, but anyway, it's not coming to mind, but it's just such a weird thing, like, we shouldn't be both of those things, but we are, but I was desperate, I wanted this way of life, I wanted the things I was seeing in you people, you guys had this joy about you, you had happiness, you had kids that were sitting on your lap, I only dreamed about having a family, those were all the things that I wanted, you know, Alcoholics Anonymous in the beginning was simply, you know, the ability to see past myself, I, I learned how to listen here a little bit. It doesn't always work, but I listen pretty good. But you guys taught me to shut my mouth, you know, and just to try to open myself up to a new experience. I'd never done anything like that. And when she started taking me through the steps, you know, she implied that maybe I needed some help in my daily life, you know. And I thought I was fine. You know, I'm an adult. I'm a grown-up. I can do this. I can make decisions for myself. And, you know, I love that idea that through step 10, you know, we... We go to you know our sponsor first and then to God. And after that we go to God and then back to our sponsor to check. And I was raised on that principle, you know, early in my sobriety, and I like that. It seems to work for me. You know, sponsorship has been like the greatest tool she ever gave me was she drug you know, drug me into all kinds of service. I went to the bathroom one like business meeting, I always tell you about that, and I was ended up a grapevine rep. I did not want to be. <laughs> but they that's what they used to do. If you go to the bathroom or you leave the meeting to have a cigarette, you're the next whatever's on the floor. And I was the next grapevine rep. I had like 14 days sober and I was the grapevine rep. It was a gift. They put balloons on my my clothes and, you know, I literally take me up like a big grape, you know, it's not fun. But, you know, <laughs> the point is I, I finally could laugh at myself. I could finally be amongst other people. You know, I was such an isolator by the end of my drinking that I had such a struggle with men and women. I mean, it would actually physically hurt when a woman would hug me. It was so uncomfortable. It was awful, painful to have somebody hug me at the end there, you know. And Alcoholics Anonymous and this woman would drag me to all these meetings. Like I said, you know, I remember being in a hospital and we were taking care of a young girl and she was, you know, feverish and sick and her alcohol level was really high. And I got to see how my sponsor talked about her life and her alcohol and, and the way in which she drank. And that's what she talked about. And then she let this girl talk about hers. And then they talk about the things together, you know, and she taught me how to talk to other people. I didn't know it was something you had to learn. And it is, you know, and it was a gift to be a part of that and to have somebody that was so active in AA. You know, I, I just come upon her by accident, you know. I love that my sponsor always talks about what would have happened the one day that he got sober, that if that gentleman had never come in to the detox, if he had been too busy watching Netflix, you know, if he had been busy with his wife making pancakes with his family that morning, he said, no, I'm not going to go to my commitment. Somebody else can do it. You know, and I think about that all the time. You know, who's missing in this room tonight because one of us said, you know what, I'm tired. I don't feel like it, you know? And my sponsor was big on that. I don't care how you feel. You know, the old feelings aren't facts. She took it to a, an art form, you know, and she didn't want to hear about it. She gave me about three or four minutes to get to the point of a phone call. She didn't let me go on and on. She explained to me, if I ever catch you talking about your problems in a meeting, it'll be the last time you're talking about problems in a meeting. The meeting's for the solution, not for the problems. What do you think a newcomer is going to think, you know, if you're sitting there talking about how awful your life is and how you hate going to AA, you know? How unkind that would be, you know, unfortunate. So she was really a good person in my life. And, you know, early on she had some other little problems with the way I dressed and some of the things I did. My hemline, my neckline once in a while almost met. It was close. But I didn't know that. I mean, needless to say, I used to just be in jeans and t-shirts prior to when I was drinking. And when I got sober, I moved in with a bunch of sober girls at a sober house, and they were all dressing up for the Friday night meeting. So was I, you know. And my sponsor put an end of that. She threw the, you know, my little mini skirt in the fireplace. Um, but, you know, she just talked to me about, you know, if you want to be respected, you're going to dress in a manner where women and men will respect you, and then you'll get all the respect you need. You know, and you also find out that all those guys at the coffee pot won't be circling around if you dress appropriately. It's shocking, but it, that's what. And she was right. They stopped bugging me. It was crazy. You know, but those are those little gifts that you get 
And, you know, and after doing some step work, I had to make those amends that were difficult. I, you know, I think about that one about TV all the time. It just cracks me up. People hate financial amends whenever you talk about financial amends at a, at a meeting. But, you know, for me, it was probably the most important financial amend. I had little envelopes that she would set out, my envelope for rent so I could learn how to pay my bills, envelope for electricity, envelope for groceries, you know, and I didn't have a car for two and a half years. I used to sponsor people on the bus. I'm telling you it can be done. But anyway, and then I had an envelope for my amends money. And I would, every time I got paid, I'd go to her house because I couldn't have a bank account. I'm one of those people that was on the list at the bank. You know what I, mean? I don't know if any of you relate to that, but that was me. And she would, you know, help me pay my bills. And one, I don't know, whatever, uh, I had worked some extra hours and I was at a Kmart and I saw a little TV. I was like, that's perfect for my room, you know? Have my own TV, I don't have to go watch that other girl in the room's TV. I can go put it outside, put it on the porch because there's plugs out in the front, you know? Thinking, I'm thinking all these great things, how I can watch my TV and have a life, you know? And I was so excited and I'm starting to walk up to the counter with it and then it dawned on me, I should probably call her. You know, so I went outside with a pay phone and I call my sponsor and she goes, so you're at Kmart and you're going to buy a TV with the money that you've earned because it's extra. So let me get this straight. You're using other people's money that you stole in the past so you can have a TV. Is that correct? And I said, no, no, this is extra money. <laughs> this is separate money. She goes, so that extra money you make, you can't put in your men's envelope and get done with your men's sooner? And I was like, I was a little upset. So needless to say, she said, why don't you come over and watch TV? And I did. And that's why I watched TV. If I didn't want to watch what was on the house TV, I went over there. And I'm grateful. You know, she was the woman that gave me rides. She drug me to all kinds of meetings and conventions. She, you know, pretty much did everything. And when I wanted to go date a guy, you know, a not so great guy, she was like, yeah, you know, okay. She, you know, let me make my mistakes. And then there was a really good guy. And you know what? I, I, I just dated him with my clothes on and he actually courted me and he was appropriate, which is odd, but there are men out there that are. And he was very appropriate and I ended up marrying that guy. And I was married to him for 22 years. And in the course of the first couple of years, it was a strange thing, we had the baby after getting married. You know, it's odd. <laughs> it's hard to believe that a lot of people don't do that. But we did, and we had this little boy. And you all know him, Sean, I talk about him all the time. You all can tell my story. I'm sure you're just being so kind tonight, so thanks. But, you know, my son, Sean, uh, not just the bright spot of, my, spot of my life, but, you know, he was a kid that really, you know, kind of kept me in check. You know, he knew a little too much about AA. You know, he was a little boy, and I would have women come into our house, and I would read the book with him, and he had his own big book, and he was writing all the time as a little boy. You know, he had his own big book, his own 12 and 12, you know, and he went to meetings, and, you know, he had it all down, and he talked about how many years, I have five years sober, because he did, you know, and, I mean, he was very in, involved in Alcoholics Anonymous, and, you know, and I wanted him to know that he had two parents that almost died from this illness. You know, don't be stupid, you need to understand this, you need to know, and he came to all the family stuff, you know, and over time, my son would check on me. Like, I remember one day I was really upset with him in a store, and I was like, Sean, get, oh, Sean, get. And he goes, Mommy, why are you talking with your teeth shut? What's wrong with you? And he's saying it really loud. Mama, why is your teeth closed when you're talking? Because I'm so mad, I want to strangle you, you know? But, but, and then he said, why don't we pray? You know? Right at the moment, you just want to like drag him out of the house, you know, or out of the store. You know, he's acting up, demanding to have stuff, and you want to just drag him into the car, and you're like, yeah, so let's pray. That would be lovely. You know? And I mean, he was that way, and then pretty soon we started praying for everything. We'd pray, you know, if an ambulance come down the street, we'd pray for the people in the ambulance. And, you know, my son today, he's a doctor, and, you know, it's a beautiful story. But, but what happened is that, you know, these principles got a hold of my son. And he was practicing it in our home way before really I ever could successfully or my husband. You know, he was like, you know, the mature person in the household, if you know what I mean? Like we were, you know, six or seven years sober when we had a kid. And, you know, he was the kid that was that bright spot. And he always could tell, you know, I remember one day being at a restaurant and he said, you know, Mama, you weren't very nice to the waitress. And uh, it's like... I don't need you taking my inventory, you know? It was, it was very unsightly, you know? And I, he was right. I had lost my patience. We'd been there for probably 40 minutes, and she'd not even come one time. And my son's coloring and having fun and eating crackers and playing with the salt, you know, you know. And he said, you're not very nice. And so I apologized in front of my son. I said, I was wrong. I was really rude to you. I'm so sorry. That was the wrong thing to do. And my son said, yeah, that's like the 
you know. And he was always there. And I know it sounds funny, but kids pick up what they're around. And my son was picking up principles, and I didn't even really know it. You know, and by the time, you know, he was like 11, 12 years old, he was running coat drives for the healing place and doing all kinds of crazy stuff. You know, that was just because he lived in a home where recovery and church and people in the community, they were all at our house for, you know, birthday parties, for anniversaries, for everything. You couldn't tell who was at our house. My, my family that all drank still came with their beer, their case of beer out in the backyard, you know. But everybody, there were people, and they were all mingling together. AA had become infiltrated in my Home. And it was like the greatest gift, you know? And just through that crazy little bit of step work and transformation that that woman did within me, and she did it. She spent the hours and hours and time and prayers and praying with me on the phone and praying with me in person and driving me back to work when I didn't want to work and, you know, all the little things and little tricks that she did. You know, that was the gift. And she taught me how to sponsor other women just the way she did it. And I remember her telling me, don't. Start adding other things to your sponsorship, you know, gift. And that's what she called it. It's a gift that I've given you. Don't change it. Do what you were taught. You know, and I've always tried to keep true to doing it the same way that I've done it to the best of my ability. And, you know, no one's perfect, but that's the gift that we get. We get to actually hand something down and not try to change it because we know better. I don't know if you're like me, but I know better. I found something pretty cool on the Internet, you know. So we want to change things up and, you know. This thing has really worked for a lot of people, and I'm just really fortunate that Alcoholics Anonymous, at the time, like I said, would even accept me. I didn't even feel worthy to be in that meeting that night. And what AA's given me, y'all know, it's not just this sober life, it's the ability to get back again. I went to back to college, you know, it was crazy, I just applied the same principles here, come sit up front, do the stuff that you always hear in all the meetings. But I went back to college, and then God was so kind to see fit that I could work with runaway kids. Shocking, of all the population of people I could work with, I get to work with runaway kids, you know? That God would see fit to let me, you know, work through all that and get to be with kids that I understood and that understood me, and they felt that I understood them. You know, those are the gifts of Alcoholics Anonymous. Miracle after miracle, transformation after transformation, and going into the prisons, you know, I was thinking, I have nothing in common with these people, and my sponsor was like, you should have been there. That's, you know, the truth. That, let's get honest here, you know, you should have been there. And, you know, beside that, the point is, those ladies, they know about prison. They don't care what you know and don't about prison. They want to know about how to live when they get out. And you know how to live out here so far. You're still sober, so you have something to give, something to offer. Now, will you invest your time? Will you make the sacrifice of your time for someone else? And that was the gift, is that's one thing I could do. I could sacrifice my time. And, I, you know, it wasn't once a month. It was every week I go. And, you know, that's been a really good thing for me is to have something that I go to, not just like, you know, our home group. We learn so much from sponsorship and then again from our home group. The commitment. I'm so fortunate. I go to a great home group. I got people, amazing people at my home group. I mean, if you're looking for a home group, I don't want to take away from came to believe. But on Tuesdays and Thursdays on the other side of the world, there's a great meeting, you know. And those people, they care about us. They want genuinely for people to find this way of life. And that's a wonderful thing to be with people like that. You know, I, you know, I could never draw a crowd of people around me before unless I was giving away drinks when I was a bartender at a cheap bar one time in Reno, you know? It's the only way I could get people to come and hang out with me. And you know, today my, my life is full of, like I said, I have people of all different types of people in my life. My life is super full. You know, I, I get, like I said, I got married, did the whole thing, had the husband, went back to college, had a great job. And now I'm retired and kind of old and I get to hang out. And I, I get to do AA, and I get to be with people all the time and do some other stuff in the community. It's not important to talk about, but stuff that is really important to me, you know, that I like to do outside AA. And, you know, that's been a really good thing for me. And the last but not least is the fact that I'm being transformed like this. I believe even if I've not said anything that any of you all relate tonight to it, I think tonight what's happened to me every time I speak is that I get that moment with God to be reminded of what he's actually done for me. And it just, it just flows over me, the grace and the goodness. Because if I didn't get to tell the story again in this manner uninterrupted, I wouldn't have that moment with God. So if y'all get something unhappy, for all you people that had to listen to it the 700th time, thank you for being a saint. I appreciate it. But more importantly, just know that I'm here, and if you ever need anything, I'm here for you. Love you. Woo!